Welcome to the next unit, which I'm going to refer to as Unit 2, Safely Transport Passengers. Once again, concentrating on that safety aspect of the job. Two outcomes in this particular unit, they are know how fitness to drive is essential for undertaking hire and reward work. And two, which sounds rather innocuous, know how to transport passengers in safety and comfort. Outcome one, know how fitness to drive is essential when undertaking hire and reward work. Hazardous situations are well known to experienced taxi and private hire drivers. As situations can be unpredictable, hazardous, stressful and tiring. Unpredictable, things happen. Cars suddenly stop in front of you, people walk out in the road, dogs run across the road. Hazardous, the weather, icy conditions. Stressful, the dispatch office putting pressure on you to complete jobs urgently, customers doing likewise, being held up in traffic. Tiring, because you're doing longer shifts and unsociable hours. This unit emphasizes the necessity of ensuring that drivers are aware of all the hazardous situations that can develop quickly and can take appropriate actions and steps to avoid or reduce any accidents at all. In other words, you need to be alert and your concentration needs to be at a higher level. We mentioned in unit one that you have a legal duty of care for the welfare of your customers. You are legally responsible for the safety and comfort of your customers and must always be aware of the effect of your own state of health can have on your ability to drive and react in certain circumstances. As I say, your concentration levels need to be high. You have to be medically fit and pass the appropriate medical examinations. As I said in unit one, between the age of 45 and 65 are medical every five years. And once you reach the age of 65, a medical every year. You must be able to uh, maintain that appropriate level of fitness and ability in particular to concentrate throughout the whole shift. The beauty of this job is that it is very flexible. Should you feel tired or have fatigue symptoms, stop working and go home. Ailments. Ailments is not in effect an illness. An ailment is where you self-medicate. It will affect your judgment and concentration. There's no doubt about it. Plus, it would be uncomfortable for passengers to be alongside you. So should you go to the pharmacy or even the corner shop to get some cough medicine or paracetamol or hay fever relief tablets, antihistamines, Please, please, please read the paperwork. It is your duty of care to read the paperwork. It may give instructions such as, do not drive or operate machinery for 24 hours, may cause drowsiness or dizziness, do not exceed stated dose. Should you not follow these instructions or should you not read the paperwork, you could be accused of driving under the influence of drugs. Ailments that I've listed here, common cold, sniffles, flu, hay fever, viruses, and just general fatigue and tiredness. You could suffer boredom during your shift, should it be particularly quiet on that day. Even when you're busy, plan a rest break. Plan a lunch break. Set your heating or your air conditioning to suit you. Be honest with yourself. Recognize symptoms of tiredness, such as yawning, rubbing your eyes, losing concentration. As I've mentioned already, you need to have a medical certificate signed by your GP, your general practitioner to make sure you are physically fit to drive the private hire or taxi. Once again, I shall reiterate, 
five yearly medical examinations after the age of 45 up to the age of 65 and as soon as you reach 65 a medical every year this medical includes an eyesight test and also blood pressure the eyesight test some general practitioners may not carry out the eyesight test and you need to go to uh, an independent opticians Whilst you're perfectly fit to drive a taxi, and when I say a taxi, I'm talking about a black cab, which all have ramps. They are accessible vehicles for disabled people. While you're perfectly fit to drive a taxi, you may not be able to physically push a wheelchair up the ramp. You may be allergic to carrying animals, highly allergic. Should this be the case, the doctor will put in his report that whilst you're fit to drive your vehicle, you cannot do certain aspects of your job like pushing a wheelchair up the ramp, or you are allergic to animals. In these circumstances, a medical ex exemption certificate will be provided by the licensing authority. Now, the allergy. It's a personal decision whether you can carry animals or not. However, with assistance dogs, it is the law that you have to take assistance dogs. You cannot refuse an assistance dogs. You need to have a medical exemption certificate to be able to refuse an assistance dog. And that medical exemption certificate needs to be displayed in your vehicle at all times. There are offences under the Road Traffic Act, which can be applied to persons who drive whilst unfit. So, should you make any false declarations as to your physical fitness? Your medical form with your doctor is basically tick boxes. He will sit with you and go through your medical records and ask you certain questions whilst doing so. Should you lie or not declare anything, that is an offence under the Road Traffic Act. Once you have got your licence, should you fail to notify the authorities about the onset of a disability or deterioration of your fitness within the five year period of your medical? Obviously, if you drive after failing a medical, you are breaking the law. Should you drive with uncorrected eyesight or refuse to take an eyesight test? So the uncorrected eyesight, it may be the optician recommends that you buy a certain type of spectacles for long distance or night driving, that type of thing. You find that they're too expensive to buy and you can continue to drive without your eyesight being corrected. Making a false statement to obtain a driving license or certificate of insurance. Should you make any false statements or false declarations on any forms, you, this is an offence under the Road Traffic Act 1988. If you've not declared a notifiable condition of which you are aware to the licensing authority, your insurance may also be invalid. I mentioned already about over-the-counter medicines and taking general medication. You could be charged with driving it under the influence of drugs. Should you need some medication, always advise your GP that you are you drive as an occupation. He may be able to prescribe a different medication for you so you can continue to drive. Failure to inform the licensing authorities of a notifiable medical condition can carry endorsements and disqualification of your driving. Knowingly making any false statements on any forms may result up to two years imprisonment under the Road Traffic Act 1988. Most of us drivers, and I'm not just talking about private hire or taxi drivers, drivers in general will have a category B1 license. All licensing authorities accept applications from drivers to be private hire drivers or taxi drivers who have a B1 license. It may be that you are suffering from a certain condition. The medical we take with our GP is called a group two medical. 
He is looking for certain things that may affect your driving. Diabetes being one of them. Diabetes type 1. Should you be suffering from diabetes, for instance, or epilepsy or cardiovascular problems or renal problems, the DVLA may issue you with what they call a category C1 license. No matter what your age, if you have a C1 license, this has to be renewed every year and you also need to have a medical every year with your GP. Please check the position with your local authority should you have a C1 license, as some councils do not accept C1 license holders. It is therefore very important to check before you proceed. In, in unit one, I mentioned about stress causing problems. This be timekeeping, customers' frustration, the weather, the traffic, all these can lead to stress. The best way to relieve stress is by having exercise, should you have. But you can also relieve stress and recognize stress. So you can fill in the blanks here. I will give you a moment or two and then go through them with you. Give yourself enough time so you are not rushing. When you are rushing, the stress factor goes up and the risk is higher. Stay alert for the latest traffic information, whether that be on your satellite navigation equipment built within your PDA or data head, or whether it be on the local traffic, uh, local radio, because uh, information is given out usually between the hours of seven and 10 and four and seven in the evening. Do not be influenced by other drivers' actions. They may give you rude gestures. Do not retaliate by giving rude gestures back. This will only lead to what they call as road rage and it causes stress and you are not concentrating on the road. Keep a safe distance so you can react quicker. Take regular breaks, as I've mentioned already. Most common cause of accidents where your concentration levels are down is tiredness. And the other one is where you are taking risks because of time, usually overtaking when it is dangerous to do so speeding in restricted areas, running a red light because you are late. Apart from the consequences you mentioned yesterday and personal injuries that you may suffer yourself, other consequences could be you get points on your DVLA license. Investigations are held by police and licensing. Your insurance premiums and excess are increased. And of course, your customers are let down. If you're in a specialist vehicle in particular and you're on your way to a pickup, they can't use your vehicle. It's been involved in an accident. Even worse, if you have customers on board, there could be injuries to them. They're not just let down, they are injured because of your risk taking, your negligence. Authorised persons who have the authority to request to see all of your documents at an accident scene or just in the course of their duties. Obviously the police. I shall go back to that in a moment. Special constables who are trained to look after traffic management, usually at country fairs, pop festivals, football matches. PCSOs, police community support officers. Licensing officers from the licensing authority, from your licensing authority. Licensing authorities who may be working as rank marshals and all officials from the driver and vehicle services agency. Let's go back to number one, police. The police have the power to stop a moving vehicle. They can inspect you, your vehicle and your documents or ask you to produce your documents. Also, the DVSA official have the same powers of the police. They've had this since 2002. They can stop a moving vehicle too, to inspect you or your vehicle. 
Licensing officers cannot stop a moving vehicle. They need to have the police with them. However, should you be parked up, the licensing office, officers once again can inspect you and your vehicle. But you need to be parked up. They can't stop a moving vehicle on their own. We shall now move on to outcome two, provided you have a full understanding of outcome one. Outcome two, as I said, the title sounds rather innocuous, but there's a lot of content in this particular outcome. Please concentrate. Know how to transport passengers in a safety and comfort. We're gonna go through the seatbelt law very methodically. Transport customers safely and comfortably. Enforcing speed limits. Driving for efficiency and talking about the environment. Okay, seatbelt law. First of all, I'll explain the seatbelt law as regards taxi drivers and private hire drivers. First of all, all drivers should know the legal requirements for wearing seatbelts. And it's quite surprising how many people don't. Taxi drivers, i.e. hackney drivers, they're exempt from wearing seatbelts when applying for hire, answering a hire, or carrying passengers within their own district. Okay, let me give you a scenario. A taxi driver picks up at a rail station, for instance. Let's say this is in Manchester. The fare is going to Leeds. Now, he's picked up at the rank in Manchester in his own district. He doesn't need to wear his seatbelt as he is working. Takes the passenger to Leeds, he doesn't need to wear his seatbelt, although he probably would as he's traveling on the motorway network. Once he gets to Leeds and drops that passenger off, the passenger pays the fare. The taxi driver, upon his return to Manchester, needs to wear his seatbelt because he can't apply for hire in another district. Once he crosses the boundary into Manchester, the city of Manchester, in theory, he can then take his seatbelt off. Okay. The key thing here with taxi drivers is that when they are working, working is applying for hire or actually having passengers on board in their district. So should a taxi driver be taking his spouse shopping or his children to school, even though he's in his own district, he is not working. He is off duty. Because he's off duty, he needs to wear his seatbelt, he or she. Private hire drivers is straightforward. They are exempt from wearing a seatbelt only when they have passengers on board. So, as a private hire driver, no matter where you are, when you have passengers on board, there is no need to wear your seatbelt. The moment you drop that passenger off and your vehicle is empty, you have to put your seatbelt on. Passengers also need to comply with seatbelt regulations and any amendments that are made to those regulations. Drivers should ensure that their passengers are belted up, but the passengers themselves are responsible for the seatbelts. I'm now going to show you a chart and go through each category. Okay, you can see I've got four columns. The first column is regarding the driver or the passenger. The next column is the front seat. Third column is the rear seat. And the last column is who has legal responsibility. So the driver himself, we've mentioned whether you're a taxi driver or a private hire driver, you should understand that, that by now. Right, age groups. From a newborn child up to its fourth birthday. I beg your pardon, a newborn child up to its third birthday. In the front seat, the correct child restraint must be used. 
which is of course would be a child seat. This can be a forward facing seat or a rear facing seat. Should it be a forward facing seat, you would need to turn your airbag facility off. In the rear seat, once again, a correct child restraint must be used, which would again be a child seat. Should the driver or parent not have a child seat, the child must travel unrestrained. By that, I mean, you would not sit a child on the seat and use the adult seat belt. The adult would sit in the rear seat and put the seat belt upon themselves and the child would sit on their lap with the adult, adult holding them around the midriff. They must not put the seat belt across the child. A couple of reasons for this. One, the rib cage is not properly developed and should you break harshly, and the inertia kicks in on the seat belt, it could crush the child's chest. And two, it could lead to strangulation should the seat belt be high around the child's neck. The driver is responsible for ensuring the correct child restraint is used and in the rear, if there isn't a restraint, that the child is sat on the adult's knee properly. Should you have a child restraint, a child seat, even though the driver himself may not fit it, it may be the parent or grandparent, whoever fits that child restraint, the driver is responsible to ensure that it's fitted correctly. There is no forward or sideways movement on that child restraint. I'm going to move on to the next category. A child age three up until their 12th birthday or 1.35 meters in height. Once again, in the front seat, the correct child restraint must be worn. So this would again be a child seat. In the rear, if you have a child uh, restraint, it must be used. This could be the form of a child seat or a booster seat. If you don't have a child seat or a booster seat, then in this instance, the adult seat belt can be used in the rear. It may be you have to adjust the height of it so it's not going across the child's neck, but it must be used. Once again, the driver is responsible for ensuring these seat belts are worn or the child restraints are used. A child aged 12 or 13 up to their 14th birthday or over 1.35 meters in height, whichever comes first. In the front, the adult seat belt can be worn. In other words, they are allowed to sit in the front. Should, be the, should they be 12 or 13 or they may be 10 years old and over the height of 1.35. Again, they can sit in the front if they're over 1.35 meters. Obviously, they're allowed to sit in the rear and they would use the normal adult seat belt. Again, it is the driver's responsibility to ensure seat belts are worn at all times. Once a child reaches its 14th birthday, it is classed as an adult. In the front, they need to wear the seat belt. In the back, they need to wear the seat belt. However, the responsibility this time is shifted from the driver to the passenger. So should the passenger not be wearing the seat belt, the driver will not be prosecuted. Please make sure you understand all of that slide so that uh, you're able to answer questions in the examination. There are exceptions to the child seat uh, rule. One, if the child is traveling a short distance for reason of unexpected necessity, i.e. it's an emergency. The child has a severe asthma attack. You need to get them home for their inhaler or for the hospital for their nebulizer. It's unexpected necessity. The child doesn't need to wear a seatbelt. 
Now, in a normal saloon car, if there are two occupied child restraints in the rear of the vehicle, child seats, you cannot fit a third. So, and an adult can't fit between the two child seats. So you've got three children under the age of 12 in the rear of the vehicle, two in child seats, the adult is in the front seat of the car. The third child would sit in the middle of the two child seats unrestrained. That is the law. Okay. Going on to road conditions and weather, etc. Transporting customers safely and comfortably. Fog, snow, frost, ice make it dangerous to drive. They reduce visibility and re reduce tire traction on the road. The highway code states, if visibility is down to 100 yards or less, you should use dipped headlights, not your side lights, your dipped headlights. In these bad, bad and poor weather conditions, you should always reduce your speed and increase the following distance, the gap between you and the vehicle in front. Also ensure your washer bottles are filled with a winter screen wash. Having an empty washer bottle is an offence and you can get points on your driving licence because of that. Always make sure you and your vehicle are well prepared for the worst of the British weather. After October, when the clocks change, darkness falls early. It's quite fashionable, particularly with the younger element of society, to wear dark clothing. Please be aware of pedestrians wearing dark clothing. Limited street lighting, particularly in rural areas. We've also suffered the next one, oncoming dazzle from traffic with full beam headlights. Poor lighting on cycles. Be also aware of your condition, tiredness, fatigue, boredom. Reduce limit points. We all have a natural distance we can see during daylight hours. When it becomes dusk, your limit point is reduced. You need to concentrate more. So, all good professional drivers will adapt their driving style to the prevailing road conditions. In other words, we respect the road, we respect the weather. Good drivers will have the ability to detect hazards at an early stage. Monitor them at a subconscious level and quickly ready to respond if the situation demands it. This is known as defensive driving. You are ready and able to react quickly. The TUG acronym will remind you of defensive driving techniques. This is straightforward. TUG. Your mind will take in the information because you are continually scanning the environment. You are looking ahead, not just at the car in front of you, but beyond that. You are looking to your left and to your right. You are using your rear view mirror. You know what is behind you. You are taking in all the information around you by scanning the environment. You will use that information to plan your response. Do I break? Do I swerve, take an evasive action? Do I slow down? Do I accelerate? Wherever possible, you will give information to other road users of your intentions by hazard lights, indicators, etc. So for instance, you're on the outside lane of the motorway. In the far distance, you see brake lights building up, a buildup of traffic. You've taken the information in. You use the information to plan your response. So your first response is to take your foot or to, off the accelerator or slow down. As you approach the standing traffic, you will brake. Your brake lights come on. You're giving information to the road users behind you. As you reach the standing traffic, you will probably use your hazard indicators. Once again, giving extra information to the road users behind you so they can also use the TUG acronym. On the caption I have here, there's no fences, 
spaces and gaps in the hedgerows, you'd be watching out for children playing, cricket or football, dogs running loose, etc. You can see there's a, a bend coming up, there's double white lines. So you do know that there's nobody coming around that bend on the wrong side of the road. In the, in the dark hours, you can see approaching lights, which warns you of oncoming traffic anyway. There may be adjacent railway line near you. There may be signs that there's a level crossing coming up. You take in all the information. So drivers who scan the environment repeatedly, and all good professional drivers do this, they will have a lower accident rate than drivers who concentrate on one area, i.e. just in front of them. Look to your limit point. So you can judge traffic and judge what is happening in that traffic. Use the information. This is what your brain does. And it does it very quickly. And you're doing it subconsciously. How dangerous is it? How close is it? What's the road layout like? Is there a blind summit or a bend coming up? What's the road surface like? Is it slippy? Is the hazard stationary or moving? What side of the road is it on? What speed is it doing? etc. Give the information to other road users of your intention. It may be a simple thing like indicating. You are continu continu continuously stopping and starting at the side of the road, which in itself is a traffic hazard. So use your indicators. When you stop, put your hazard lights on, giving drivers other information. As you are continually stopping at start of the road, it's very important to signal your intention. Mirror signal maneuver. The maneuver part of this, I'm gonna break down into three sections. Mirror signal position speed look, MSPSL. Mirror signal position speed look. This is what you do as you're rejoining traffic flow, once you pull away from the curve, as you're at a junction, you're turning left or right, you will be using this mirror signal position speed look. Thinking and stopping distances. Okay, please listen to my words very carefully. From the moment you realize you have to break, i.e. you've seen an incident, to the moment you actually apply the brakes, i.e. your foot touches the pedal, that is known as the thinking distance. From the moment you apply the brakes to the moment the vehicle actually stops is the braking distance. Together, these are known as the overall stopping distances. Thinking distance and braking distance and therefore the overall stopping distance, can never be decreased. They're always increased. So it could be you're coming to the end of your shift, so your concentration levels are lower. Thinking distance is increased. You are feeling a bit under the weather. Once again, concentration is reduced, so therefore your thinking distance is increased. The road conditions, it's wet, it's icy. Braking distance has increased. Your car has got four passengers and four lots of luggage. The vehicle's heavier, it takes longer to stop. The braking distance is increased. Your vehicle's poorly maintained. Braking distance is increased. The vehicle is going downhill. Braking distance is increased. The typical stopping distance Overall stopping distance at 30 mile an hour is 23 meters. At 50, it's 53 meters, and at 70, it's 96 meters. This is on a good dry road in a well-maintained car. That is distances. Time-wise, please remember that in perfect conditions, Time-wise, the overall stopping distance is two seconds. So you should be at least two seconds behind the car in front of you. Say to yourself, only a fool breaks the two-second rule. 
pick out a marker on the road, such as a lamppost. As the rear bumper of the car in front passes the lamppost, say that saying, only a fool breaks the two second rule. As you say the word rule, the front of your car should be passing the same lamppost. That is the distance you should be behind the vehicle in front. So it's no matter what speed, you'll see it on the motorways, the chevrons will be placed. It will say keep two chevrons apart. That is two seconds at 70 miles an hour. In the wet conditions, double that to four seconds. So it's twice as much. Also at 30 miles an hour, you may want to keep for extra safety a little bit further back because you don't know what other factors are affecting the stopping conditions. So you may want to keep one meter up apart from each mile an hour you're doing. So for instance, at 30 miles an hour, you would keep 30 meters apart rather than 23. This is known as the safe following distance. Don't forget, thinking distance, braking distance, and therefore overall stopping distance can only ever be increased. Getting behind large vehicles or wide vehicles, maintain a safe distance. It gives you a better view, a better view um, obviously, so you can see when it's safe to overtake. And also the driver himself of the HGV, um, if, if you're too close, he can't use the TUG acronym because he doesn't know you're there. He can't take in the information. You may see a sign on the back of these vehicles stating, if you can't see my mirrors, I can't see you. As I say, exactly the same for a wide vehicle. Road signs. Why do we have road signs? What is the main function of road signs? Most people would say to give you information. I'm going to concentrate on the two bottom two on the left hand side. The red triangle and the red circle. These are there to control speed. You must be able to recognize all road signs. If you don't, you can't explain the, you can't use the purpose of the road sign. So forget what's in the middle of the road sign for the moment. A red triangle means warning or danger. Depends what's in that sign. Could be slippery road, high winds, cattle crossing. The red circle is an order, a prohibition board order, not allowed. So on the, on the sign I have there, no cars. If it's got 30 in the middle, no more than 30, etc. Obviously we've got no entry, we've got keep right. The environment, fuel is expensive, you need to conserve as much fuel as, as possible for your pocket and also to reduce effects to the environment. So to reduce harmful emissions, all drivers should accelerate gently. Select the correct driving for the road conditions. Use a low gear to gently slow the vehicle. So you're not braking harshly at the last second. Ensure your tires are correctly inflated. If you have low air pressure, you're using more fuel and burning more rubber, both harmful for the environment. Use the air conditioning sparingly. Air conditioning in general uses between eight and 10% extra fuel. Bad for your pocket, bad for the environment. All vehicles now have trip computers. They will monitor your fuel consumption or your miles per gallon. Obviously, you need to service your vehicle at regular intervals to get the best out of it. Speed limits. Residential areas, particularly around schools and town centers, where there may be not only um, pavement signage, but signage on the roads themselves is usually 20 miles per hour. 
unless signed differently, all roads with street lighting will carry a speed limit of 30 miles an hour. Non-built up areas where a high speed li limit is considered to be safe, there will be repeater signs on lampposts placed at regular intervals. These will state that the speed limit is either 40 or 50 miles per hour. Should you be leaving one of these roads and going onto a housing estate, for instance, the initial sign you will see when entering the estate will be 30 miles an hour. Then you won't see any more signs because on that estate, there is street lighting, 30 miles an hour. The national speed limit, which is the sign I have there on the top right hand corner, is 60 miles per hour. Not 70, 60. However, on a dual carriageway and a motorway, that is increased to 70 miles per hour, unless there is other signage saying 50, 60 or 40. A dual carriageway, for your information, is when there's traffic in two directions with a hard barrier in between, whether that be a curb, a hedgerow, concrete barrier, metal barrier, fence, trees, etc. But there needs to be traffic in both directions with a hard barrier in between. Exceeding the speed limit carries a penalty of um, level three thousand pounds that's from your licensing authority and usually three points on your license with a hundred pound fine. Uh, you could be disqualified if you've got other points on your license. Uh, please be aware there are categories of speeding now that the magistrates and the police can enforce. Um, these are categories A, B and C. Uh, for your information, uh, they are quite hard to enforce, but for your information, category A is anything between one mile an hour and 10 miles an hour over the um, speed limit. Category B is anything between 11 and 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. And category C, anything between 21 and 30 miles an hour. These will carry uh, penalties such as 50% of your relevant weekly income and anything up to six points. The licensing authority. Should you have six or more penalty points from the DVLA, it can affect your application for a license or the renewal of your license. Should you get points on your license whilst you hold the license, you need to tell your licensing authority at renewal. Depending on how serious the traffic offence is, the licensing authority may thank you and just take no further action. They could give you a written warning about any future penalty points. They could suspend your license for a period of time, even though the DVLA have said you're still allowed to drive. So they can give you a month suspension, a six month suspension. They could actually revoke your license if they feel you're not safe to carry passengers. A driver can be disqualified by the DVLA, this is your driving license, for a minimum of six months if you accumulate more than 12 points within a three year period. However, you can appeal to the magistrate's court against that disqualification. So you can continue on your occupation. For your information at this stage, let me explain. The driving license is your driving license that everybody has to drive a vehicle on UK roads. It is issued by the DVLA. Your driver's license is your taxi stroke private hire badge issued by the licensing authority. Driving, DVLA, driver's licensing authority. Cameras. The Gatso. The Gatso camera will take information of your vehicle should it be speeding as it goes past the camera. In other words, the photograph has, is from behind. This is because the Gatso has a flash system and it cannot take your photograph from the front. The Truvalo. The Truvalo operates on infrared. This can take your photograph from the front because there's no flash, but it can also take your photograph from the rear. The arm you see there 
is sometimes on a swivel and can take traffic from either direction. The specs camera, you would normally see where there's been accident, high accident rates or where there's road works on a motorway, for instance, to protect the workforce. These are average speed between two points. So should you inadvertently go through the first camera, let's say at 70 on a motorway, where the speed limit is reduced to 50 because of roadworks, drop your speed so that you are not speeding going through the second camera. Because the first camera will start the time you go through it based on time till you reach the second camera where they can work out your average speed between the two points. All of these cameras have automatic number plate recognition. Handheld lasers held by the police in a van, sometimes on a tripod, so they've got stability. Also held by volunteers who have been trained by the police. Traffic light cameras, they will take um, a flash picture like the Gatso. If you go through more than 2.9 seconds on, uh, on red, on amber, beg your pardon. Uh, the traffic light camera can also work as a speed camera. So it can take speed as well as um, jump in the light. Driving for efficiency. Let's just talk about European emission standards. European emission standards from July 2008 to January 2011, all vehicles in the UK were working to emission standards Euro 4. From January 2011 to September 2015, working on European standards, emission standards Euro 5. And from September 15 to present day, we are working in the UK to Euro emissions standard 6. Please maintain your vehicle regularly to maintain its efficiency and to reduce emissions. Efficient speeds. If you're driving efficiently at the speed and respecting the road conditions, you will save fuel. Excessive idling. Excessive idling is when your engine is running unnecessarily. So you're parked up, you're keeping your engine running to keep warm, or you're waiting outside someone's property instead of turning the engine off. You're there for 10 minutes or so, leaving the engine running. Excessive idling produces more emissions, uses more fuel. The use of stop-start technology has massively reduced excessive idling, obviously, and therefore reduces emissions. That completes outcome two. It also completes the unit. I hope you have a full understanding before moving on to the next unit.